Good morning. The types of radical polymerizations we've been discussing um, up until the last couple minutes of Monday's class were uncontrolled or free radical polymerizations. And for the majority of commodity polymers and even engineering plastics that are polyolefins, that is materials that are derived from monomers bearing a double bond, which is sometimes called a vinyl monomer, um, are, uh, are used really ubiquitously. So the chairs you're sitting in, chances are the backing was made from some polypropylene fabric the seat plastic is made from some other polyolefin, um, possibly polypropylene or, or polystyrene or, or not exactly sure what. So, and all of those are made by free radical polymerization. But the pr and, and sometimes we don't, we don't care that the molecular mass distribution is not very well controlled. You know, you could have some prematurely terminated, terminated chains and some outrageously long chains. Um, but that's okay, because the final product is all, we, uh, is all we care about. But there are some circumstances, particularly in, um, in modern applications in semiconductor manufacturing and anti-fouling surfaces, in biomedical nanotechnology, um, in, uh, in drug delivery and pharmaceuticals, where it's not acceptable to have such a huge variety of molecular uh, molecular weight distribution and also we need to be able to functionalize surfaces uh, and functionalizing surfaces meaning so for example if you have a, a ship and uh, barnacles grow on it um, and the barnacles cause uh, um, turbulence I'm not a fluid mechanician but they cause drag in the way that the ship moves through the ocean. So what if you could functionalize it with a polymer material that didn't allow adhesion of, of the zebra mussels or whatever they, are, whatever they are? Suppose you have some nanoparticle drug delivery agent that you want to, that you want to add a, uh, a, a protein or a ligand or a, or a drug to or something. You need to be able to functionalize the surface. Another reason why you might want uh, why a free radical or random or uncontrolled polymerization might not be good is because suppose you want to make a what's called a block copolymer where instead of all A chains you have A chains then B chains but they're linked covalently. It's very difficult to take an A chain and a chain of all A's and a chain of all B's and then and then link them up together. It's possible but it's much easier to, to polymerize one off of the other. So in such a way, we can use controlled radical polymerizations to accomplish uh, these goals. So the, the key aspect of a controlled radical polymerization was the fact that we are in equilibrium between a dormant state which, in which the system exists most of the time, and we have a reactive state or an active state where some capping group comes off of the end of the growing chain to allow a few monomers to trickle in uh, a few at a time. And in that way, the average molecular mass increases linearly with the extent of polymerization, whereas, uh, whereas it looks more like a hockey stick in the case of uncontrolled or free radical polymerization. So there are three methods for controlled radical polymerization that are used. The first one is the nitroxide um, mediated radical polymerization. And I discussed that one first because it's the easiest to, to draw on the board. So the X group was the tempo group. It could be another type of nitroxide, but tempo is the most common. Um, but the problem with, with the nitroxide mediated polymerization is that it, um, is that it's not the most tolerant to all kinds of functional groups and all kinds of monomers. You can't make every kind of polymer with it. And you also can't make a, uh, a, a, a nitroxide bearing group that has, say, uh, that's, that's on a surface or that has some functionality that allows you to, to, to bond it to, um, to, uh, to some other chemical 
moiety. So there are two other methods of controlled radical polymerization that are by far uh, more um, prevalent in, in the scientific literature, but also in industrial uses, and those are called uh, atom transfer radical polymerization, or ATRP, which it hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet, but it almost certainly will in the next few years because many, uh, I don't know, a bajillion roughly tons of stuff is made using, uh, using ATRP processes. And the other technique, which is a little bit newer, but, uh, but about as, as versatile, is reversible addition fragmentation termination polymerization, or RAFT. So that is the first time you'll ever, first and last time I'll ever use the full name uh, uh, of it. So um, this technique, so we're gonna start with point two <laughs> because one was the nitroxide mediated polymerization. So this is um, atom transfer radical polymerization or ATRP. And basically what you have is some polymer chain or monomer that has an, uh, that has a halide group, almost always bromine, but this could be iodine or chlorine as well, but bromine is by far the most, uh, the most common. And what you have is a copper catalyst, which is don't don't worry too much about about what this is. This is a copper catalyst that where the char the copper one charges is uh, is balanced by a bromide minus, and then this is a, a ligand that stands for uh, for bipyridine. Um, and just if you're interested in what Bippy long stockings uh, looks like, it is this. This is Bippy. And what you have is a activation rate constant and a deactivation rate constant. And this is the dormant state. And what happens is that the copper catalyst really likes to homolytically cleave carbon bromide bonds. So the bromine goes from the growing pol polymer chain to the, um, uh, to the copper catalyst to give you Pn dot plus copper two plus Br2 and the Bippy uh, uh, ligand. So if you're in this state, you can then add monomers in. But if you're in this state, it's, it's dormant, you can't add the monomers in. So this is pretty, pretty much the same as the nitroxide mediated process, except you have uh, a much greater range of potential substrates that you can use because of the idiosyncrasies of this chemistry being generally more uh, tolerant to functional groups than the nitroxide mediated. Importantly, what you start with, so often you start with an initiator which can have anything on it. So this could be, for example, a, a metal, a semiconductor, could be a protein, or other biological structure, and you can even 
trick the genetic machinery of a cell to produce these groups on a surface. And the reason we have this tertiary, uh, this bromide attached to a tertiary carbon atom, so these methyl groups sticking out here like rabbit ears, is just because the, uh, the radical is more stable if there's more space on the radical uh, bearing carbon atom to delocalize. So that's why often the initiator species has this substituted pattern. When you go to, when you see in the literature and in a, in, a, in a technical talk on this, on this process, if you see this kind of motif, you're gonna, you're, you can say, oh, they're going to do ATRP on that, react, on that surface. Yep. Oh, so PN stands for polymer with like any number, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But this could also be the monomer. If you're just starting with just the monomer, it can be the monomer. Yep. Yes, in this case we have multiple, uh, we have multiple adjacent uh, initiator groups on the same surface. So if we do um, ATRP and we add in some, uh, some vinyl monomer, what we end up with are these growing polymer chains and this is called a, a polymer brush that we have that we've made because we've functionalized the surface with the ATRP initiator. So we add in the ATRP stuff and the vinyl monomer and we get these densely packed chains on the surface. So the, I, the chances that we could add densely packed chains to a surface without directly polymerizing off of the surface are not very good. Because if we try to take a chain that has one reactive group at the end and try to bond that to a, uh, to a surface with some other reactive group, it's really unlikely that you're going to have a blob of polymer landing on a surface and then straightening out to allow another blob of polymer to come in and straighten out. So you wouldn't get this packing density if you tried to do this any other way. Uh, what you also can do is make, uh, is make star polymers. So polymers that have some uh, core that has many functional groups on it and you can ATRP off of the core to make a, to make a star. And for example, a three-pronged initiator could look something like this. Once you did uh, once you did ATRP on this, you would end up with a polymer that had three chains coming off of a central core, which is kind of like a nanoparticle. Yep. So a bromine on a carbon uh, atom plus the copper catalyst uh, makes this an initiator. It's only an initiator in the presence of the copper catalyst. Okay. Because it, it generates the radical by sucking the bromine uh, off, along with only one electron, and leaves one unpaired electron on the carbon atom. Good question. Uh, suppose you had something more complicated than this. You could also have some you know, six-pronged star polymer that just had some synthesized core that had more than just three bromine, uh, bromine atoms. Okay, that's all, yep. Um, could you do this in the presence of like uh, monomers? 
Yeah, so you can make, uh, you can make uh, die block or tri block <laughs> copolymers this way. Suppose you are here and you've used up all of this monomer, but because we're still quasi living, we're still, uh, we can, we're still in equilibrium between these two states, even though we've used up all the monomer, we can add a monomer of a different type in. So suppose instead of vinyl X, it was vinyl Y vinyl anything. And the nice thing about block copolymers, and we'll talk about them a little bit more next week, is that they tend to have the best of both worlds properties. Instead of um, an average of two properties that you don't want, you get the desirable properties from both blocks because they're not allowed to phase se segregate because they're, they're linked to each other chemically. Yep. Uh, the question is, are they, always, are they always produced where each monomer is totally consumed then the next one you add in and then it's totally consumed? No, there are some reasons where you might want to make a gradient block copolymer where you have all A's and then right before the A's are about to run out, you, you make the D's. Then you have this region which is fewer A's, lots of B's, and then the A's finally run out and then it's all B's. So there are, there are reasons to do that, primarily in research right now, but um, there are a lot of reasons why one in principle might want to make a gradient copolymer. Okay, so this is you know, roughly half the literature on uh, controlled radical polymerization. A growing, um, a growing body of work is, uh, is on this technique called uh, reversible reversible addition fragmentation termination or raft Polymerization, and the nice thing about this is that it can be used in emulsions and water, um, but there are some caveats to using it. And for one thing, it's not the initiator, initiating group that ends up being the thing that we can functionalize with nanoparticles or surfaces, but actually it's the capping group. It also works by quite a different and uh, quite uh, complicated mechanism that I'm going to go slowly through. You're not responsible for the mechanism, only what's, what the final product is. But I want you to see it because um, in a class of this size, some of you will be doing this professionally. So the general scheme has a monomer. An initiator a diphyoester and this is called the raft agent and the product So let's say that we are polymerizing this guy, which is methyl methacrylate, um, MMA, mixed Marshall methacrylate. And polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, is also known as plexiglass. Um, it's also the most popular electron beam resist that's used in semiconductor manufacturing where you carve out patterns in your, uh, in your photo mask using an electron beam and it's this material that absorbs the electrons and becomes soluble then you can modify the underlying surface. Yeah. Does the angle of that last matter? No. Does the angle of this methyl group matter? No, it rotates freely. 
Um, and polymethylmethacrylate, methacrylate, one of the most useful, uh, one of the most useful polymers in all kinds of um, all kinds of scenarios. The initiator can be a typical radical initiator like ABIN or DBP, di dibenzoyl peroxide, and we'll just call this just call this I. The dithioester almost always has this general form, or the, we'll just call it the, the raft agent. Raft agent has this form, has some Z group connected to uh, dithioester, has a Z group connected to a carbon atom, and then this is a, a uh, instead of oxygen atoms here, which would be an, a regular ester, we have um, two S's. And what the raft agent is very good at doing is, is drawing, um, is absorbing radicals in a reversible way. So it's called a chain transfer agent, which is where the, it's not termination, it's transfer. I'm like, where is my transfer word? Termination, we don't actually want to happen. <laughs> Reversible addition, fragmentation, transfer, polymerization. Termination will happen eventually, but it's not the desirable thing. So what we get uh, when, we, when we polymerize is uh, polymethylmethacrylate. But if you look at this, so this is the repeat unit, but if you look at the end groups, and in this case, the end groups are actually quite important because it might be the reason why you do this reaction to begin with. The end group will be either, um, be either I or R as the, uh, as the fragment of either the raft agent or the initiator fragment, and I'll go through the mechanism of how this works in a moment. with the other part of the raft agent at the end. The, I keep doing that, dithioester. So this is really the product, but we have this stuff at the end. This is, yeah, this is the interior. This is considering the end groups. What are Z and R? Um, a common raft agent might be you do not need to memorize these structures. Please don't memorize these structures unless you want unless you want to, but which which is fine, <laughs> which is fine. It's, it's good enough to know that we have end group control and that we are making this polymer, but in a controlled way. The purpose of the Z group is that it allows radicals to delocalize into the, into the bulk structure, so it's a good chain transfer agent. The purpose of this group is that it can initiate uh, other radical reactions. The purpose of the cyano group is actually quite practical. It's so that this thing does not smell like shit. <laughs> Literally. Because dithioesters do not smell good. But for some reason, if you have the cyano group, um, our nose does not perceive it as being as horrible as it is. Let's look in a little more detail at how we get such a weird looking uh, product. So the first step is initiation. And it's the same first step that we would always have in a radical polymerization, we have some initiator fragment I dot. I'm going to use I dot instead of R dot because we have an R dot that we need later. Hope that's okay. We use I dot plus 
m gives you uh, some uh, some polymer with a that has a, an active uh, chain end. Then we have propagation. which is pn dot plus monomer goes to pn plus one dot. So far, this is exactly the same as any other radical uh, polymerization, same as any free radical polymerization. But because we have the raft agent, this is in a huge excess huge excess and really likes to transfer chains to it, what we're going to have is this guy, some, some pn dot or pn plus one dot is going to collide with the raft agent. So this is a, the raft pre-equilibrium. Where we have pn dot, this could be pn or pn plus 1 or some early on chain that was initiated by the initiator fragment. What it is going to do is react with the raft agent, which is very good at transferring chains uh, to it. And we have some equilibrium where the pn reacts with the sulfur group to give you a radical on the raft agent. Now here, what happens? Here what happens is that we've chosen our R group so that it's also a stable radical but is capable of initiating chains. So what happens is that this bond undergoes a homolytic cleavage to give you the PN stuck to the raft agent plus r dot eventually we use up eventually but relatively quickly we use up all of the initiator molecules but because these initiator derived chains have collided with the raft agent we now have this new initiator which is this r species then the process begins again, but for real this time, with the R as the new initiator species, which is present in a big excess. So this, uh, so the next process is reinitiation. Reinitiation is. R dot reacting with monomers to give you P sub M dot. And the reason I'm using M instead of N is because I mean to say that the chains that were initiated with the initiator fragment have the subscript N, and the chains that were initiated with the R dot group from the raft agent, which is, now the, which is going to be the majority of chains in the final product, have the subscript M. Then we get to the, the, main, the raft main equilibrium. Which is PM dot reacting with the raft agent, which has either the PN or another PM group already on it. And this is in equilibrium with the, the bis raft adduct, which means two groups that are attached to the raft agent.
unfortunately, I have to delete some, delete, <laughs> erase uh, some of the, uh, what's over here? And now uh, this has a choice, either it can dissociate over here or over here. to give us PM bonded to the raft agent plus PN dot. Final step, which is undesirable, but does what will eventually happen is termination. And I'm going to use different subscripts here because it, they, I don't care if they were derived from the initiator chain ends or the R dot chain ends. So PI dot plus PJ dot either gives you DI plus J or you get PI dot plus pj dot goes to di plus dj, where the d's are the dead chains. And anything that exists in this equilibrium is still living. Ideally, this doesn't happen until you've casted your final product and it's in its final shape and you don't care what happens to the last few straggling chains. Um, which one is disproportionation, top or bottom? Bottom. Bottom is disproportionation because we have two dead chains of approximately the same size whereas we have an average of doubling of the chain size for, uh, for combination. Okay, so these two sides are the active side of the main equilibrium. Because PM dot or PN dot can react with other monomers. And this, the, the, the bis adduct to the raft agent is the dormant state. is the dormant state. Now what do we know um, about these, uh, about the relative concentrations of these, uh, of these species? We know that this exists in a very small quantity because the initiator derived fragments are small, concentration is small compared to the R dot derived fragments because the raft agent, I erased it, but the raft agent is present in a huge excess in the group. So PMs are much more prevalent. PMs are much more prevalent than PNs. So we don't have much of this. We have a lot of this. Uh, but we don't have many free radical chains to, uh, to begin with. So what we really have is, um, is mostly, mostly this. This is like the desired product. And at any point in the reaction, you end up with a distribution of stuff. And this is, this is a little bit of a sloppy, a little bit of an inelegant process because you get a mixture of stuff, but you get primarily one thing. And we just have to learn to live with the impurities because it's better than not making anything. And so uh, if we look at the distribution of products, distribution of products, we have these initiator derived chains, which end in the raft agent S, C double bond S, Z. We have the, and this, the repeat units along the backbone I had been calling PN, or PN. 
the raft agent R derived uh, derived products with the raft group at the end. This is the major or desired product. So everyone see why this is this. Some of our chains are dead. And they are minor, ideally. And then at any point in the reaction, you also, if your reaction isn't completed, you also have the radicals also at the end of the reaction. You might still have some free radicals, but the concentration in a bulk material of this stuff is going to be so low, and it's going to be quenched pretty easily by just being in the environment um, that we don't worry about it. So this, for all intents and purposes, is the major product with some dead ends and the PN structure as like a, could be a 1% impurity or something like that. Yep. So what makes the middle molecule dormant? The middle molecule is dormant because this uh, radical species can't initiate another reaction. This, the radical is just too stable here. So in order to, re to initiate a reaction, or in order to propagate a reaction, one of these chains has to come off. And um, how do you, is there a way to favor a homolytic cleavage from one side than the other side? That's a really good question. Honestly, I don't know. But they're so similar at this point because the only difference is could be hundreds of atoms away. Otherwise, it's the same. So this is an interesting contrast to ATRP, where the initiator is sort of the important part versus the capping group being the part that we, are, uh, that, that we can modify. So for example, the Z group could be attached to a surface, or the Z group could be attached to some biomolecule or something. Um, The most important thing, though, is to know the product and to know the, uh, of, of this reaction and of ATRP. You don't, you're not going to have to reproduce all of these steps or anything. Don't worry about it. There's not a lot of learning that happens in, uh, in there, although some of you will do this professionally. Let's just look for controlled radical polymerization in general. So this is nitro nitroxide mediated polymerization, ATRP and raft. Suppose we look at the number average molecular weight as a function of P from zero to one. And we look at the polydispersity or just dispersity means the same thing um, as, a, as a function of P from 0 to 1, where this is the extent of reaction. This is the fraction of reacted N groups from, uh, from previously in the class. And if we look at the molecular weight in units of uh, 10 to the 4 Daltons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, let's say, and we look at the polydispersity index between 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4. What we're going to get for the average, the average molecular weight as a function of the extent of reaction for the controlled, um, uh, for the controlled uh, polymerization will be controlled radical polymerization will look like this. And this is characteristic of all living processes. So it's, it's pretty easy. You just calculate the number of reacted monomers, and you know what the average molecular weight is, because they all grow at roughly, the same, uh, at roughly the same size. If you look at the polydispersity um, index as a function of the extent of reaction, now keep in mind, this is already kind of a compressed scale. We're not going from 1 to 10 here. We're going from 1 to 1.4. And what we get is some curve that saturates at some 
at some p value at some relatively low polydispersity index. And the reason for that, why would, why would we have higher polydispersity at the beginning? You're on your phone, you're not listening. If you have a reaction at the beginning, then there's a much bigger difference between chains that are one versus two units long, even though they're only a difference of one unit long. The, the difference between one and two is twice, whereas the difference later on in the reaction between 100 and 101 is 1%, 1 not 100%. That makes sense? That's, that's why polydispersity goes down as the extent of reaction proceeds. Okay, now we're going to talk about the exam. <laughs> So we have this uh, nine minutes here. Um, if you send me your questions by email by noon today, I'll incorporate them into the video office hours, which I will post uh, later this afternoon by dinner-ish time, because I need time to prepare for it. Uh, and then we also have um, Sam's office, Mickey's office hours, uh, right after class and Sam's office hours on uh, Thursday tomorrow uh, afternoon at 5 at 5 um, so there will be plenty of time to uh, to to review so the exam is uh, 50 minutes here uh, pen or pencil a calculator with extra batteries if you fear your batteries are low um, a phone is not a calculator for our purposes. Um, an equation sheet will be provided. Um, I will not have an office hour on Friday because I'm doing the video office hour today. Uh, and some key concepts to know. This is not a principally an organic chemistry class. Um, for example, Monday and Wednesday will be the last time we talk about reactivity of any kind whatsoever, for better or worse. We're going to be talking about um, uh, solution thermodynamics and how, uh, how polymers form microstructures and how those microstructures give you bulk and thermal properties. And that's really the rest of the, the, rest of the class. Um, but the chemistry part, so the reactivity part, will pretty much be over um, Monday and a little bit on, a little bit on Wednesday. Um, but for example, you should know if you combined these guys at, under the appropriate conditions, what would it give you? Yeah, this would give you nylon junk junk. <laughs> yeah, it would, give you, it would give you nylon with some whatever, whatever in the middle. Um, one thing that I want to point out, we, we mentioned this briefly in the, in the class. Um, well, let's say we have the same thing basically works with alcohols or hydroxyl groups. And you can mix and match these with carboxylic acids or acid chlorides. Acid chloride being more reactive than the acid, you need some catalyst or extraordinary conditions to get that to go. Um, otherwise, like high heat and high pressure. Um, and so, what what you know? What would this give you? And can you could you mix and match this and, and this and, and get the right uh, and get the right product? You could. So these are AA BB type monomers, but you can also have an AB type monomer where you have something in here. This is a hydroxy acid, and this is a single component reaction, and if you can draw what you would get there, that's good. Um, we talked about polyglycerol cocebicate, and I just want to point out the fact that these 
alcohol groups, these primary alcohol groups, react much, much faster than the secondary alcohol groups because they're crowded and they're not as reactive. So when we made the, the polyglycerol cocebicate, this part didn't react at all. Um, okay, so these are polymers that have that have C double bond O's in, in the backbone and atoms that are not uh, carbon are often produced by step growth mechanisms. This is, these are polycondensation reactions. They, they proceed by step growth kinetics, Carruthers equation and all that stuff. It is possible to make products like, uh, that look like these that were derived by chain growth mechanisms, and we'll talk about those later, but don't worry about it for the purposes of exam one, these step growth. In the case of, vinyl monomers. where it could be phenyl or methyl methacrylate or who the hell cares, you always get the same product. You get a zigzag you always get something that looks like this. And these proceed by chain growth. And they could either be made by a free radical polymerization or a controlled radical polymerization. The free radical just dump in the ABIN or the DBP and it's off to the races. That's the popcorn mechanism, the uncontrolled free radical mechanism, or it could be nitroxide mediated, ATRP or raft. And the difference is, is that in ATRP and RAFT, you have control over what the end groups are, which is useful, and much lower molecular, uh, much lower dispersity of the molecular weight, and you have a linear dependence of the extent of reaction, or the extent, uh, linear dependence of the average molecular weight on the extent of reaction. Yep. <coughs> You will not be asked to derive the Flory distribution, but you should know what it means. So um, some other concepts that I jotted down, configuration versus conformation. Configuration involves the breaking of bonds to get from one state to the other, whereas conformation is just how the atoms are arranged in the molecule and solution. Uh, glass transition versus uh, melting temperature. Glass transition temperature versus melting temperature. Um, I'll, I'm actually going to cover that in the, t in, the, uh, in the office hours in the video today because people have been asking about it. Um, the Carruthers equation, what does X sub N and P mean? I'm also going to have a section on the important variables in the uh, TA, uh, I keep saying TA, in the, um, in the video office hours today because I know that there are tons of variables and it's, it's not easy to keep them all straight. I realize that. Um, let me just make sure that I get through these things and I'll answer the, I'll answer the question. The concept of uh, stoichiometric imbalance, you would be given that equation, dihedral angle, Newman projection. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize any structures except for amine, alcohol, carboxylic acid, acid chloride, and the linkages that you get, ester or amide and carbonate, which we also covered. Um, the structure of polyethylene, structure of polyethylene is that, I really hope everyone can just please memorize that. Um, kinetics of step growth, self and acid catalyzed, you don't have to derive the whole thing, but you should know how to write down a rate equation and what the final plots look like, either x sub n squared E has some functional form, and X sub N has some functional form. Um, radical, uh, free radical polymerization, entropy of polymerization just qualitatively, step growth versus chain growth, uh, controlled radical polymerization, at least the very basics uh, of it. And I'll take these two questions. So the grass analogy and like the Parker analogy, they're both for chain growth, but it's just uh, free radical or controlled. Free radical popcorn, controlled radical grass or teacups. 
out in the rain. Yep. Polyethylene, amine, alcohol, carboxylic acid, acid chloride, plus the products, the linkages that you get with these reactions, plus carbonate, which is ester but oxygen on both sides. And it's just because polycarbonate is like one of the most important plastic materials. We're out of time now, but thank you very much. And 